Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Natasha Dumerville, and I am the Diversity and Inclusion Fellow here at Harvard Divinity School. Since 1992, January 16th has been recognized as Religious Freedom Day in the United States. In the 2017 Proclamation of Religious Freedom Day, President Obama asserted, religious freedom is a principle based not on shared ancestry, culture, ethnicity, or faith, but on a shared commitment to liberty, and that religious freedom is more than an idea, it is a basic human right. In a bill for establishing religious freedom, Thomas Jefferson wrote, our civil rights have no dependence on our religious opinions. However, it seems today our civil rights are becoming more and more entwined with our religious opinions. In 2015, approximately one-fifth of all hate crimes in the U.S. were because of religious bigotry, and we are all aware of the recent talks of a Muslim re registry. This afternoon's conversation will focus on the present and future states of religious freedom in the United States and be led by our panelists and moderator, Harvard Divinity School professors Diane Moore and Dudley Rose, and Harvard Divinity School alum Aisha Ansano. Diane Moore is Senior Lecturer on Religious Studies and Education, the Director of the Religious Literacy Project, and a Senior Scholar at the Center for the Study of World Religions. Her research focuses on enhancing the public understanding of religion through education from the lens of critical theory. Currently, Professor Moore serves as the Principal Investigator for the Religious Literacy and the Professions Symposium Series and the Religious Literacy and Humanitarian Action Research Project and is a member of the State Department Office of Religion and Global Affairs Task Force to enhance training about religion for foreign service officers and other State Department personnel. She is the lead scholar for the Harvard X Massive Open Online course, World Religions Through Their Scriptures, and coordinator for the Harvard Extension School Religious Studies and Education Certificate. Professor Moore is an ordained minister in the Christian Church. Dudley Rose is Associate Dean for Ministry Studies and Lecturer on Ministry at the Divinity School, where he oversees the MDiv program. He has headed programs and taught at HDS since 1987. His teaching and research interests include Ministry Studies, Life, Thought, and Ministry of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Congregational and Institutional Leadership, The Use and Effect of Digital Technology and Social Networking in Society, Churches, and Ministry. He is ordained in the United Church of Christ and serves as a congregational senior pastor from 1983 to 2016. He has given papers nationally and internationally on the topic of religious freedom and most importantly, or excuse me, most, most recently at the gathering of experts of the International Association for Religious Freedom. Aisha Ansano is a ministerial intern at First Church of Boston and a candidate for uni Unitarian Universalist ordination. A recent graduate of HDS, Aisha wrote her MDiv thesis on the phenomenon of dinner churches and considers food to be her ministry. Aisha has worked with Interfaith Youth Corps and is committed to the ideas of religious freedom and interfaith cooperation. Aisha will serve as the moderator for this evening's discussion. And before turning things over to our moderator, I'd like to quickly share information about another event. The Racial Justice and Healing Initiative a student group here on the HDS campus is offering anti-Islamophobia training this evening from 6 p.m. to 7.15 in Rockefeller Hall, room 117. In this workshop, members of the HDS Muslim Council will break down Islamophobia as a discourse and well-funded institution and discuss the impacts of systemic profiling Muslims in their personal lives, community realities, and narratives of HDS students in Muslim communities in the U.S. and across the world. This workshop will shed light on the shared struggles and intersectionalities between Muslims in the U.S. and other marginalized communities and offer practical calls to action for community members, especially under a Trump presidency. And Thanks, now, Natasha. Um, I just want to say first that I am excited to be here. I have not sat many times on this side of this very room, so <laughs> it's exciting. Um, I think we'll just go ahead and start off. I have some questions, but we'll try to have a bit of a, a dialogue. So how would each of you define religious freedom? And then going off of that, what does it mean to you personally and as um, you know, a religious professional and uh, educator? Um, so I uh, stand pretty close to the constitutional definition uh, as a starting point uh, that uh, the government may not uh, impose uh, a religion and neither may it prevent the practice of one. 
Uh, for me, that's been uh, a hallmark of uh, a free society here in the uh, United States and in many other places around the world. Um, and yet, it's also one that from a number of quarters, there are uh, calls uh, that it is under attack. And uh, some of those I would uh, concur with, and many of them I would interrogate. Um, so first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. Great to be here with my old friend, yeah. good colleague. Uh, we, we're walking over here, and we realize I don't think we've ever been on anything officially before together. No. No. Um, so I concur with the definition that Dudley shared and it's of course enshrined in, our, uh, in the First Amendment. I just also want to say two important caveats, if you will. Religious freedom in a vacuum means very little. So it's got to be in a context uh, to be engaged and understood. And that context, I think, is what we'll probably be getting into in both historical and social. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that religious freedom initially, historically, uh, in the First uh, Amendment, was really not about the more lofty goals, or at least not in part the more lofty goals that we associate with it. In fact, that was a kind of a compromise among the uh, factions and the different um, colonies early to basically say that they were they would have loved if they could to have imposed their own religion on others, but also did not want to be uh, vulnerable to the imposition of another's religious beliefs. So uh, an important framework of how the First Amendment came about has to do with a, kind of a compromise, a recognition of the importance of diversity. And then the third is I want to just make a note that we've got a, um, a program at the State Department that's focused on religious freedom. And it's a, it's a problem, it's a challenging uh, department because again, we're, uh, historically we've wanted to represent the values of, that we understand that to mean in our own context and uh, use it to Im import that set of values in other places, which has caused some real problems in relationship to our di diplomatic uh, and, and social justice arenas. So, so I just use those, those examples to talk about context and the importance of that as much as I also really lift up religious freedom and, and hold it quite dear. But it's important to remember that it doesn't uh, exist outside of context. Well, going off that idea of context, um, I'm curious to hear a little more about how this idea of religious freedom has changed over the course of time and in what ways it is tied to particular times or social contexts or historical events or things like that. Um, what, what does that trajectory look like, do you think? Um, so uh, there's this wonderful exchange of letters between Moses Sexus and George Washington. Um, in 1790, Moses Sexus was the warden of the Hebrew congregation in Newport, Rhode Island at the time. And when George Washington came to uh, visit the colonies right after the ratification of the Constitution, he was greeted by dignitaries, as he was everywhere. And Moses Sexus was one of the dignitaries chosen by the Newport community to greet, to greet the new president, the, the president of the, new, of the new, uh, newly formed con uh, Constitutional Convention. And first of all, it's pretty remarkable that a Jewish member of the community was selected to represent. That's an important point. Um, and there's this wonderful exchange uh, that I'm going to just read brief remarks uh, on, because I think it's a, this for me would be an aspirational framework of this. Um, and this is uh, Moses Sexus. He speaks earlier about how uh, his, the Jewish people have been persecuted throughout time, and he said, uh, deprived as we heretofore have been of the invaluable rights of citizens, we now with deep sense, a deep sense of gratitude to the almighty disposer of all events, behold a government erected by the majesty of the people, a government which to bigotry gives no sanction, to persecution no assistance, but generously affording to all liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship deeming everyone of whatever nation, tongue, or language equal parts of the great governmental machine. Um, and then he goes on. And uh, Washington later then responds to him, uh, a couple days later. 
uh, picking up that language to bigotry, no sanction, to persecution, no assistance. The citizens of the United States of America have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, a policy worthy of imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. And this is an important point that I want to highlight in terms of aspirations. It is now, this is Washington, it is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it was by the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoy the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it all on occasion their effectual support. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there and in a bit I can talk about two, a few, couple other very significant moments historically where uh, this understanding of religious freedom has not been followed, but I wanted to lay that foundation because that's an aspirational foundation that I think is hard to really manifest, but is really important and worthy of our representation. Yeah. Thanks. That's a, so I'm going to be a, a, a little bit more recent in that uh, in, in terms of uh, thinking of the trajectory, but uh, I think in terms of what Diane just said of the aspiration uh, that uh, was spoken of uh, back at the founding uh, of the uh, country, it's it's a little uh, hard to find it in uh, recent history in its in anything like a pure form, right? Uh, one in one case, uh, it there are often. Uh, tensions between uh, the, uh, the notion of religious freedom and uh, human rights uh, or the law of the land, and so the, they get adjudicated along those lines. And then um, I think who comes under its protection uh, and uh, are the two areas that I'm, I'm most concerned about. Uh, so in terms of the, the uh, tension between uh, the law of the land or human and human rights sometimes and uh, religious freedom. Uh, there have been a number of uh, court cases uh, in which uh, religious groups have been or religious individuals uh, have been uh, disallowed from performing uh, certain uh, activities which are within the purview of their religious practice. Uh, the two probably most famous uh, are the, uh, the Native American church uh, against the, uh, in 1990, against the Employment Division Department of Human Resources uh, of Oregon versus Smith, which ruled that Alfred Smith and Galen Black could be fined uh, fired for cause and be refused unemployment benefits for using the illegal drug peyote, uh, even though that drug was ingested as part of the religious ceremony. Um, there's also the uh, 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 case in which uh, the, the rules uh, regarding polygamy were adjudicated by the court, though it was uh, by the Mormon religion part of religious practice, it was not allowed uh, by the, uh, the courts, or at least uh, in, in certain levels of the adjudication. When those cases came under uh, investigation, when, they came, when, they, when people began to look back at them, particularly I'm thinking now of the Clinton years, they began to say, you know, if we're going to have this tension between religious freedom and the law of the land. We can't just employ this willy-nilly, and we can't employ it with, with uh, too many built-in biases. And so if we're going to, uh, in some way or another, limit religious freedom, uh, then it needs to be done only to the extent that is necessary to protect the uh, 
the rights of others and the rule of the land. And that, uh, that uh, came under the RIFRA, the Religious Freedom uh, Restoration Act that Bill Clinton was part of. It was a, it was a bipartisan uh, act at that time. Uh, and it was aimed at, uh, at these cases, and particularly the Native American case, of trying to say, look, we, is, it, is it really harmful to the common good if somebody practices their religion in, in this fashion? And that became um, the uh, one way of looking at, at those uh, tensions. I'll have more to say about that because reefers show up quite a bit <laughs> in more recent uh, conversations about religious freedom, and I think maybe both the left and the right have gotten a little bit off um, uh, track in terms of what the original intent of those were. But I'll, I'll leave that there as I think of the changes. It's been trying to, to think about this tension between um, those two, those two things. The other thing that I would say, and th this is particularly true in, uh, again, in a more recent framework. I, I think maybe in the in the beginning that uh, Diane is exactly right that religious freedom wasn't necessarily to protect the vulnerable, but it, it but it has become that, right? It, it had become understood to be a way of protecting those who uh, were vulnerable either because they were minority religious perspectives or for other reasons. And what we've seen more recently is uh, people in power using the claim of religious freedom to uh, actually impose their will on the vulnerable. To me, that's a huge change that has happened within uh, the, the last half of the 20th century. Aisha, can I pick up yeah. on that? So, so I want to build off of what Dudley said about um, this trajectory. So we've also got a significant court case in the 1970s, uh, Wisconsin versus Yoder, when it was in, actually in relationship to education when the Amish community wanted to uh, keep their, uh, just only require education from K through eight, uh, eighth grade instead of the requirement into secondary education because they wanted to practice, have the freedom to practice their religion. The, the Supreme Court case in that decision uh, in the 1970s, remember, it was a really tumultuous time in the United States history. Um, the Supreme Court made a decision that yes, they could uh, represent and, with, and uh, be exempt from the requirements of education because that um, Im the importance of religious freedom in that particular community and what the values they represented were really celebrated, agrarian values, uh, community values, et cetera. So, so it's really shocking then that in 1990, the Smith decision is really an important one that Dudley mentioned. And the decision was actually that uh, the um, Smith and, and his, I can't remember his name, uh, co-plaintiff, were denied unemployment benefits because of their uh, use of peyote. They were working at a drug rehabilitation clinic and they tested for peyote from using it in the context of, a, of the Native American church. It was really clear that was not contested, but because the Oregon law says that they can't have, uh, that it's a, it's a federally banned, or it's a federally banned substance, and Oregon law protected that federal ban that they were denied unemployment benefits. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act in a really divided Congress were outraged because they wanted to protect the religious freedom of this minority tradition. So it was one of those few moments of bipartisan support where Republicans and Democrats came across the aisle and they voted into law the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in 1993 that protected, it was basically under, it was supporting the notion of the religious freedom as, as protecting vulnerable citizens. Uh, in 1997, that was to ban, uh, considered unconstitutional as a federal mandate, but then states could enact that same uh, law and starting in 1997, and several states did. I'm gonna jump ahead a little to Citizens United, <laughs> which gave, uh, in, in 2010, I think, gave um, courts the uh, ability to uh, have free speech protected. Corporations had the ability to have their freedom of speech protected. So corporations now were protected under the First Amendment. 
Following that was Hobby Lobby, which was really a pivotal case. So that was 2014 where uh, Hobby Lobby uh, Corporation wanted to withhold uh, the contraceptive benefits under the Affordable Care Act to their employees uh, out of a firmly held religious conviction. And the court, very narrow decision, upheld that. And they gave, uh, under the, the use also of the protection of corporations, uh, free speech rights of corporations under the uh, Citizens United ruling. This was pivotal. This is a pivotal moment. And that also, it's the Hobby Lobby precedent and the um, uh, Citizens United ruling that also then gives sanction to other conservative Christian groups primarily to um, impose, based on the religious freedom assertions, uh, ability not to serve. And the Missouri law, for example, the governor in, 19, in 2016 signed a law that protected companies from serving uh, particularly LGBTQ persons uh, related to issues of baking cakes and things for now the federal law to allow for gay marriage. So we've got what, I just want to fill, fill us in with that because we've got what God Dudley spoke about was, a, a, and that's the reason I wanted to emphasize context of religious freedom is so critical. What's happening in terms of uh, how religious freedom is defined, who's defining it under what mandates, and what ultimately are we protecting because if it's just the freedom of any individual to, to, or a corporation now to hold any religious belief they want, uh, it really can come in conflict and violate other fundamental uh, values that we have enshrined in our Constitution. And that, I think, becomes a really interesting challenge and tension. Yeah, that's right. I think the, uh, the, the, the thing with the, with the reefer was that it, that it was meant to make a dis or help make a distinction that was already there between the belief and practice of one's religion and actions which flow from that practice, right? And it, it's always been understood that certain actions that flow from that practice can be regulated in the ways that we've just been talking about, right? That, but what, what seems to be new here, this kind of twist that Diane's talking about, is that the actions of, uh, th that the actions that are being talked about are not the actions of the practicers of the religion in the same way, right? It's, it's, it's not protecting someone who is, uh, uh, of, in, in the case that I made, of a minority religion from the uh, actual uh, influence of someone from, uh, that has power over them, but it's saying, if I don't like the way uh, you do something. If it's against my religion, I have the right to tell you not to do it. And that's a completely reversed notion, mm. right? Of of where of where we've been at, and uh, and it's very hard to make. E even as as the, uh, Diane said, the reefers became state uh, or uh, uh, regulations. Uh, most recently, after Hobby Lobby in in Indiana. When that, uh, what had been an, a bill that had a real bipartisan support, when that bill came, was proposed in Indiana, it was anything but bipartisan support. It was seen as uh, a tool of the right. In part, the context had changed uh, because of Citizens United. In part, it was clear what the intentions uh, were in, in passing that. But if people had actually held to the original intent of those, it would have said, look, the fact that I find your lifestyle abhorrent does not give me the right to impose my religious beliefs on you. I just, you know, that's not my, that's not my right to do. And to me, that's been uh, the most devastating kind of outcome of this change. Yeah, I think you've both sh painted this really good picture of kind of this trajectory of what religious freedom has meant and the, the way that the Riffers have changed meaning I think is really important. Um, the aspirations that we come from, the realities that we're, we have faced over the course of the last several decades. Mm -hmm. And I think all of that context puts us very squarely at the election in 2016, the presidential election, and all of those things kind of coming together the way that they did 
um, and, and the campaign rhetoric. And so I would love if you could each talk a little bit about how you think um, the election of Donald Trump will change, has changed, is changing, what religious freedom looks like, what it means, what, um, what we can expect in that area. Where to begin? <laughs> um, let me say one uh, critical piece that relates to the l larger work that I do, which is the public understanding of religion. I think the, the combination now of a misunderstanding of Islam, particularly religion more generally, and a use of religious freedom is, a, I think, we're in a dangerous moment historically. So one of the consequences around this um, targeting now, explicitly targeting Muslims um, and Muslim majority countries now with this recent ban is based on an association of Islam with uh, violence and terrorism, problematically so completely in terms of its sweeping allegation. Um, and then also a notion that we that Muslims are not going to be protect. This watch this. This is this is really key for our mm -hmm. contemporary situation. There's uh, promoting coming out of the White House and and now his council, his national security uh, advisors, some of them, are trying to make a distinction between religious uh, religion in terms of its freedom of protection and and Islam, which they are uh, uh, associating with political. Uh, <coughs> ideology. First of all, as though those two can be separated, which is itself the problem. It's a really critical problem. Mm -hmm. we, we're building off of a very problematic a way we understand religion, which is that it's somehow the separate practice that has some, somehow some purity outside of religious, uh, economic, political understanding. But that's such a widespread assumption that this language is now has, has some legitimacy and some, um, some currency. And so this notion is being promoted to uh, exclude the current uh, executive orders coming out of the White House from being challenged on religious freedom grounds. Mm -hmm. And that's very dangerous, really dangerous. Because if you uh, separate them, then again, we're associating and we have then even a deeper road of capacity to be able to consistently claim Islam equals terrorism equals our concern for our national security equals legitimacy of executive orders. This is exactly what the foundations of a police state require. And we are, without trying to sound too alarmist, I think we're dangerously close, or we're certainly laying the seeds for this. And this can become a quote unquote credible ideology if we don't challenge it. So it, I, I agree with everything that Diane just said. Um, you know, I think looking at um, the election, I, I would want to trace it back further than that. I mean, I think for at least the last decade, um, uh, this has been uh, in the works. The, um, the There's a kind of... Um, benign, uh, somewhat enlightened, or presumably enlightened notion of the Trump election, that there were a whole group of people who somehow were uh, left behind, misunderstood, not noticed, and that they rose up and, uh, and made themselves uh, present and manifest. Um, I'm not ready to buy that. Uh, First of all, that group of people has been inspired for the last decade by some vitriolic uh, rhetoric, particularly on the right, to make, to say instead of when we're coming out of an economic crisis, we have to pull together, saying instead it's blamed on the Mexicans, it's blamed on the blacks, it's blamed on the Muslims, it's blamed. So this, this is that kind of rhetoric set in place something that gives. Uh, a, a huge 
uh, kind of platform and strength to to this people who indeed are, uh, you know, if if you listen to the talk radio host, you know, there was a great fear that it is a fading majority. You know, we're not any longer going to be a white country. We're not any longer going to be a country of whatever whatever it is. And that uh, that sense of you know what brought all this on? We elected a black president. We have, have an Affordable Care Act that that black president promoted. We have same sex marriage, we have international terrorism, we have a whole bunch of things, all of which has been blamed on a gr several groups of people who are now uh, in, the, in the situation that uh, Diane mentioned, that, that, that they're going to, or that the, the executive orders are aimed at all of them, and there is a huge what uh, I think the term that is becoming uh, used that, that I certainly uh, resonate with is uh, is populist uh, authoritarianism, which is that kind of police state that we're talking about. And it's, it's a very dangerous uh, kind of move that completely isolates itself from the checks and balance structures. Right. If you look at the way this Trump White House is working right now, uh, Congress is, uh, is not in it. We don't know where the courts are going to be. There are going to be ways in which the courts are going to be uh, uh, eliminated from even having their judgments being taken seriously if we're not careful. Um, I've, I find that to, to, to have this kind of false equivalency that is so much in the air if you watch the news today that, well, we have this group over here who feels this way and this group over here who feels this way and we should just say, well, these are two things. Uh, it was like uh, I said to my staff today, you know, it's, it's, you have one woman over here who's taking her daughter to uh, kindergarten and another woman over here is torturing her daughter. We'll have them on CNN and talk about two ways of parenting. Um, you know, that's, that's, I think, in some ways the way in which we have fail to come to grips with just how distorted this discourse is getting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we could we could talk about that forever, but I want to kind of oh, no. move to <laughs> just a little bit um, kind of in the same vein, but you know, Professor Rose, you talked a little earlier about how um, the intention initial intention of the refres has has shifted and changed and and become something else. Um, that, it, that it's gone from this protection of minority religions, which really seemed like a big part of the intention at the beginning. Um, and um, Professor Moore, you know, you talked about Islamophobia and, and this rhetoric of excluding Islam from religion. Um, and I would love to hear you both talk a little more about the groups that are at risk right now, that that is both groups at risk, have facing risk to their own religious freedom, but also groups kind of facing risk from the newer definition of what religious freedom means um, and and what you think the next few years might look like for those groups and maybe what that might look like for those of us outside of those groups. I'm going to I'm going to take your question and take it in a slightly different place although uh, push pull me back if okay. it's not helpful. So I want to highlight I want to highlight some, uh, and I'm just thinking now off the top of my head, but so, so one of the foundations of the First Amendment is, um, is to protect religious communities from government, uh, undue government intervention, and to uh, allow diverse religious communities, even those that will practice things that we find uh, abhorrent, the freedom to do so if they don't infringe upon other fundamental rights, and that if is a really critical one. So I'm gonna, I wanna just talk for a little bit about um, this time we're in and the potentially, potentially important and very critical role that religious communities can play in a way that uh, other government agencies and, and government uh, sectors may have more obstacles in their place. So I'm going to talk about the sanctuary movement for a moment. Uh, so the vulnerable communities, I think we all know who they are. Uh, we've got our immigrants of all kinds, Muslim uh, immigrants from Central, South America, Mexico, especially. Um, 
I mean, let, let's just pause for a moment. We've got now this, I, this is, I think we all know this, but I think it, it's really important to say we have one of the most major, like worldwide crises in uh, migrant communities right now, displaced persons in the, around the world. Hundreds of thousands of people over years displaced for uh, war, for climate, related challenges, for economic related challenges uh, brought about by widespread globalization. None of us are immune from responsibility for some of these factors that I think is also critical. It's not that this is happening somewhere over there and somehow wherever the we are over here, <laughs> somehow it's some, something else. And, and it's at this time that we have now this ban on immigration. It's a, it's a, I find it to be a moral travesty. And so as a religious person, I feel very strongly, and as an American citizen who believes deeply in the patriotism about what it means to hope, uphold those values that I spoke about earlier, represented by the Sexus Washington Exchange, that uh, it is really incumbent upon us as citizens to, 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 to take a role here. And I think religious communities have now a special potential place to do, to, to take that on. We've talked about here in the Harvard Divinity School about uh, the possibility of becoming a sanctuary um, community. We have hit walls around that because of, the res of our connection with the larger um, Harvard University. We can't act independently of that. But we certainly can uh, align ourselves with religious communities in the greater Boston area and in the Cambridge area who are absolutely pursuing this and are technically protected uh, from government intervention, more so than cities and towns who are declaring sanctuary because they will have vulnerabilities around federal monies and all kinds of other vulnerabilities that they will not be able to, uh, that, they, that they will at least be targeted most likely. Hmm. Now, here's, so here's the challenge. Uh, it's not, if, if to the extent that religious communities actually do bind together and perform this, this service in a meaningful way, they will be targeted and the religious freedom question will be used somehow. And that's what I'm speaking about earlier about how do we de define what is religious freedom, who gets to be protected by religious freedom, how is the First Amendment going to be employed. This is where we need communities like this people who are in the academic study of religion to be able to really challenge in as vociferous ways we can and everywhere we can to challenge the nature and use of this kind of language, uh, to challenge its credibility, to challenge its accuracy, and also to then uh, really watch out for this police state language of uh, national security overrides everything. Because that's gonna be, that is what we're, that's what we're seeing having mounting that's the language that's going to get used to justify these kind of actions. So I would just love to have us be really incredibly uh, vigorous in utilizing the incredible resources we have in our religious communities um, and the important work that religious communities can play uh, right now during this really critical uh, moral, moral crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, thank you, Diane. I, I agree with that. Uh, the, the one fear I have, we've already seen uh, uh, the kind of specter of IRS rules uh, employed against nonprofit organizations and other uh, organizations that we, uh, such as churches which get tax exemption if they involve themselves in political activities. Um, and so I don't think that the churches are going to be exempt uh, from that, uh, having been the minister of a church for uh, 33 years, uh, I can tell you how, how uh, uh, reliant we were on our donations that came tax exempt and the fact that we didn't have to pay property taxes. And so those, I think, so what that brings me to is, I think Diane's exactly right, we need to, to support uh, churches and religious organizations not only because they have some exemptions, who knows how long they'll last, uh, but we come from traditions. I mean, the tradition I come from, you know, had and share with uh, my Jewish brothers and sisters has, you know, talks about, uh, you know, welcome the sojourner. We were once sojourners in Egypt. You know, that's that's who we are 
and who we are supposed to be. And so to me, it's, it's gonna be important for all of us to, to whatever the, ultimately, uh, and, and I, let me just uh, speak uh, more freely than I, or more energetically than I am, am want to on, on this. Um, I, there's a guy over at the uh, uh, Kennedy School, uh, Yashu Mushad, who uh, says he, he's now the most, and has been the most pessimistic person in the room, wherever he is. And it's, he's beginning to, or he has probably begun before, far before I did, to see the world uh, the way that I've been talking about it, a, a very big concern. So I do think it's gonna take action resistance, and I think it's gonna take an enormous amount of uh, perseverance to stay together because the tactics of of divide, take away the money here, take away that there, are, are going to be things that will be employed against people who try to resist. And, again, and for what it's worth, we don't. We also know this, but I think it's worth saying. And 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 I don't have the answer for this, but I think that's the, that we are the we're a community that needs to wrestle with this question. So clearly, re religious communities are across the whole spectrum here. So we've got many, many, in fact, the majority of um, evangelical Christians, anyway, uh, supported and continue to support uh, President Trump and his, and, and his policies. I, I continue to believe that many of those people, uh, we have more in common with them and, than we do against them in any kind of way around these concerns. but. But I think it's a really critical question, building bridges uh, to those communities to, uh, I, for me as a Christian, call out other Christian communities from a Christian perspective, not to say that mine is right, but my, to try to be persuasive about my understanding of Christianity and why the foundations that I would like to uphold would challenge many of the assertions that are also being uh, supported in the name of Christianity. So I think within our communities, we who do hold religious convictions need to not be shy about um, <clears throat> engaging others within our communities who disagree with us. I hope in a in an informed, respectful way, but I, I would also say in a very assertive way, because a lot's at stake here. Uh, and I and I I'm wrestling with this question myself, and I'll just put it out there. I also think at some point. We have to make decisions about our energies. And if, if those conversations aren't going anywhere, uh, I think we try, but if, we, if those conversations aren't going anywhere, I think we need to then redirect our energies toward just protecting the values and representing the values that we believe and are holding dear and that are now threatened. Because people, I mean, again, this is obvious, but uh, lives are at stake. And lives have always been at stake. I think the uh, enormity of the challenges now have woken up a majority group in the United States now in a way that lives have always been at stake in these questions. But the concerns haven't been always shared by so many people. Right. I mean, I think that um, the, the valorization of othering is is quite remarkable, right? In the in this present time, I remember Christopher Stendhal um, several years ago now, maybe 20, 25 years ago, in a conversation when he was asked about um, racism, he said, "Well, racism, of course, persists, but it can no longer be noble." We're back in a place where racism and all kinds of othering are now noble again, right? And that's really scary. That's, it's, it's a way, it's a place that I think most of us who grew up in a democracy like this never thought we would go backwards. We all, I've at least thought, you know, mature democracies are the kinds of things that move ever toward freedom. Not, they don't uh, go backwards, but it's stunning to me uh, and so I think, you know, apropos of what you were saying, Diane, is that we try to make partners, we try to build bridges with people, but these stakes are very, very high. And the discourse is really very, very problematic at this point. And so how, how 
possible that is, I, I just don't know at this point. It just seems to me that, the, 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 that there's a real question mark there. Yeah. And again, just to say how grateful I am and uh, that in the latest ban, so many Christian groups said no. Christians said no to giving the exemption for Christians coming from Syria, for example. Uh, these are the sorts of things we have to stand up to and stand up against. Um, the, de the desire to try to divide uh, and, to, and to address, ed to challenge those. And I've, I've, been, I've been pleased to see so many communities come out in that regard, again, around the religious divisions that are also trying to be fueled here through this rhetoric. Professor Moore, you said earlier in um, your definition of religious freedom that it, you know, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It can. It's always contextual. And so I think our conversation here today is steeped in a very particular context, like, and a context that's changing minute by minute at this point. Um, and so, you know, this conversation would have been different yesterday, and it would have been different a month ago, and it would have been different a year ago. And so, um, I just want to thank you both for for being right in this very context with me. And I think um, as a graduate of HDS, HDS has always seemed like a place that has the ability to hold the theoretical and academic with the, the reality and the context and, and trying to figure out how to, how to take the theoretical and the academic and the intellectual and put it into practice in reality is a very, very difficult thing and also a very, very important thing. So thank you both for speaking to that a little bit. Um, we're gonna open up for questions for just a few minutes. Um, Natasha will bring a mic around if anyone has any questions, you can just put your hand up. Can, can, wait, can well. you wait for the mic? Yeah. We wanna get it on the recording, so. No, we're passing, we just wanna get it on the recording. Okay, um, I'm really interested, um, uh, Professor Moore, in your position in the State Department um, and how, if that has changed at all in the last month or less. And also, uh, there was word of lots of resignations in the State Department. And, and so I'm really interested in what you have to say about what's going on there and what, what you, we can do. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, the, I realized when you were reading my bio, that's actually formally that <laughs> task force ended. But I, I, I do have a comment to make. Several of my colleagues that were uh, organizing that task force, and frankly, I'm not sure what, I don't know whether the work of our, of our task force will now continue. In fact, we're not even sure what's going to happen with the Office of Religion and Global Affairs, which Sean Casey led. We, we, there's no, there's no buddy yet in line to replace him, so we're not sure what's going to happen with that. But I will say that there uh, are many, well, there's been a, I mean, everyone now in the State Department is wrestling with a conscience about whether to stay career people who aren't political appointees. So one of my uh, uh, friends is wrestling, I won't say her name, but she's really wrestling with this question. But one of the things she said that made s such good sense to me is that she is feeling like if everyone leaves, if everyone leaves, not only is there no, she, she says we, we, we're not gonna have very much power, but we will, ha we will be able to be witnesses. Mm -hmm. And that to me was a really critical mm -hmm. recognition. And, Pushback, yes, but she's not under any illusion that their voices are going to be able to have a major impact. But to be witnesses mm. is really critical to understand what happened and, and, and what, what, what are we going to learn from this. Mm. So that's one thing. The other thing I just want to say is that part of, <coughs> part of the work related to that, and I happen to, for example, now through that work, I'm in conversation with our di diplomat in uh, uh, Erbil, Iraq, who's working with the Ministry of Education there, and the Ministry of Education there wants to revamp their uh, religion, religious education curriculum. Uh, and so I'm doing consulting work with them and working with the Ministry of Education in Erbil. I mean, these are people that are in the middle of a war, and they're still paying attention to their own, to their, to their educational mm -hmm. communities. We, we cannot abandon these people. Uh, 
And especially now, it's going to be even more challenging for them. So I think, I think those are the tensions that I think are real, yet I also really support and understand the people who feel like they cannot be uh, puppets to this new or, or participants in this new change. Any other questions out there? Oh, sorry. Just a quick one, really, but I'm, I'm, what I've been really concerned about as well is, is the lack of strong voices on the religious side that we're seeing. I know you're pointing out that there's been a few comments um, from religious leaders about not just um, looking for Christians to help. Um, but do you see any potential for that? I mean, you're talking about us um, finding ways to talk to the evangelicals who disagree perhaps with our values. I mean, how can we get that, get more voices in there, um, leadership voices really that will speak out because you know it, Trump is using, Christ, he's talking about Christians, he's, he's trying to appeal to a Christian base, but it, obviously in totally the wrong way. Uh, I'll, uh, you may see this differently, but I, you know, I think one of the things that we have to face is that the Christian voice uh, is uh, muted, not so much because it's not there, but because it's not heard. Um, and not uh, the churches that had influence in the time of the Niebuhrs don't have influence now. The head of the UCC, the head of the Episcopal Church can get up and scream to the wind, and it's not going to make very much difference. It may not even make the front page. Uh, so I think it's going to take groups of Christians. I don't think we're going to be able to look to denominational uh, and judicatory leaders to give voice. I think it's going to have to be a movement from the ground, personally. Um, yeah, I would agree, although there are a few, and I think if we can find them and broadcast their voices, that's really good. Like, I, I feel like, you know, the, the, the call, we're all Muslims now, I think is appropriate. I, I, I hope they, I, I almost hope that they introduce the registry, because I think that there'll be many, many people coming out to register. Um, I'd like to say, uh, with Pope Francis, we're all Catholic now. <laughs> I'm uh, liking a lot of what he's doing to support him. Um, but I agree that, that for uh, any, the, a host of reasons that are much more complicated than we have time to go into now, why the voices of the conservative, um, some, some conservative religious communities are at the forefront and why more moderate to progressive voices are at the sidelines is a much more complicated conversation, but they exist, they're out there. Even though they are weaker, I will also say that. I just wanna to say too, as a minister in formation right now, I really resonate with a lot of that. And I think with a lot of what you asked too, is how do we get our voices out there and trying to find the balance between both, you know, wanting to be, have that national platform and also what is my role? Do I, what do I say on Sunday morning that mobilizes people who show up on Sunday morning, who then connect with other people who go to events, who join coalitions, who are doing the work? I think that speaking up and having that national kind of megaphone is really important. Um, and I think it also is really important, the, the grassroots groundwork that gets done, um, because that's often what actually gets things done, but it is a hard balance. It's hard and frustrating to see, you know, religious voices that I really disagree with get the microphone. Mm -hmm. We probably have time for one more question. If there's not another question, I can't believe I just forgot his first name. I think it's, is it Roger Moore at the, Southern Baptist Convention? Oh, I don't remember. It's not right. Okay. I don't think it is. I'm having one of those moments, excuse <laughs> me. The, the, the first name is out, but I remember his last name as Moore. <laughs> uh, he's been a really interesting figure. I disagree with him on just about everything, except he came out against Trump uh, in the election, and he raised concerns. Uh, he was really in a minority in, in the um, conservative Christian movement. I haven't followed what he's done recently, but I'm interested to know where what he's doing now. So I think those voices is, is another place to pay attention, that it's not a uniform group, and it's really critical to, to find coalitions where we can. 
And then I want to make one other comment that's a crazy controversial thing probably to say at the end of a <laughs> forum, but I'm going to make it anyway. I was struck, um, I was at the Women's March in Washington with my daughter and nieces and great nieces and realized how old I was <laughs> at that moment. <laughs> um, but, I, and I was, I had wonderful conversations with an incredible number of people, uh, many of whom were there under some duress because of their, um, I'm, I'm not going to say pro-life, I'm going to say anti-abortion stances. This is another place that we have got to look in a, in a ground to say there are many, many people who are uh, ag against abortion who I think we can find coalitions with if we talk about reducing the number of abortions, right, as opposed to this either or kind of ban. I think there's an incredibly important group, especially religious communities in that arena that I think it's really crucial to still, for me, for my personal belief, absolutely uphold the right for a woman to have an abortion and to be federally funded. I believe that deeply, but I also feel like it's a really important place for us to join with other people to say, how can we reduce the need for the number of abortions that have to take place? No one, want, no one is pro-abortion. No one is pro-abortion. Uh, people are pro-choice around those decisions, those difficult decisions. So I think that's another place in, in this arena of what really drives people rhetorically and in terms of their convictions um, to support, to be on opposite ends of a place. I think we can be closer together. Sorry. Yeah, no, <laughs> not that I need the last word, but um, the, that's why I said that, that I thought the reefer stuff, particularly in Indiana, got more complicated um, because it did become this zero-sum game, mm -hmm. right? And we had a pizza parlor being basically tried to be put out of business because they wouldn't uh, cater a gay wedding. Now, how many pizza parlors cater gay weddings, right? <laughs> I mean, to get to this point that you've got to uh, win at that level and in that kind of aggressive uh, slamming down nature means you just don't can't have conversations. Well, on that note, <laughs> we are going to wrap up, but thank you both for sharing all of that, and um, thank you, Natasha, for putting this together, and thank you all for being here. Thank, thank you. you.